Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Great Days Outdoors Magazine. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. We have a great show lined up this week, but first, let's hear who's making the show possible. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Great Days Outdoors Magazine. Are you looking for that one-of-a-kind gift for Father's or Mother's Day? If so, head on over to greatdaysoutdoors.com and check out the best gifts for outdoorsmen 2021. We've curated a bunch of unique gift ideas to help you find an awesome gift for the outdoorsman on your list. Just head over to greatdaysoutdoors.com slash best gifts for outdoorsmen to check it out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am your host, Butch Theory. I hope you guys are having a great week. We've had a little bit of wet weather. I feel like a broken record saying that. It seems like these days whenever I'm talking to you guys, uh, we're always wondering if we're going to have a big bubble of fresh water. Fresh water came on down. It was almost crazy. I could see a tide line kind of coming down the green, and then the water started turning brown on me. All the rainwater coming down yesterday and this morning. So if our rivers browned out, uh, I would imagine most of the tributary rivers around here are the same way. Let's go ahead and get right into the reports and let's find out if uh, this rain's been affecting our inshore and our surf fishing. Let's head on down to, well, let's just let him tell us where he's been because we never know. Let's head on down and see what Captain Patrick Garmison's doing with Ugly Fishing. How are we doing today, Captain Patrick? Man, Bush, it's, it's a good day, man. Good day. Had burned way more gas going from uh, Fort Morgan or from Weeks Bay down to Fort Morgan and back than I did fishing. We um, <laughs> That's a good thing. Kind of slow, yeah, we slowed down and just kind of picked some areas apart and just almost caught fish the entire morning. Now, granted, we had that giant mo- monsoon come through this morning and we didn't get started till 8 a.m., but I mean, we, we were able to fish from about 8.15. We wet our first line and, and picked our last line up about 145 and heck we were catching something pretty much most of the day so it was uh it was fun awesome what are you guys targeting and has that been kind of the the trend throughout the week or was today a little bit different because of the rain or what you've been up to yes yeah, so today what i did is is i went deeper fished some deep structure in the bay and i i mean i like how high the water got it really opened up some shallow water areas but in my experience I've had trouble after a big, hard rain going shallow and it, it may just be me overthinking things. I don't know, but I've, so I, I I wanted to avoid some fishing my traditional shallow water stuff. And a lot of this shallow water stuff I'd been around has been kind of near creeks and rivers and stuff like that. And and as much rain as we've had yesterday and again today, man, it was, um, that's just screaming low, that's screaming low salinity to me right now. Screaming super low salinity, bad, bad water clarity. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was, it was roaring out. So the tide was coming in when I left weeks bay and the, uh, no wake buoys were laid over flat because all the water trying to get out of the rivers and out of weeks bay. So it's been that way here in foul too. So I just was like, man, I don't want to go beat my head against the wall trying to do that stuff. So we fished deep and this was today was really the first sign of like that kind of summer ish type fishing where you send a shrimp down or a croaker or throw a jig or whatever. And it could be a speckled trout, a redfish, a ground mullet, a sheephead, a puppy drum, a shark. Uh, what else do we catch? Spanish mackerel, <laughs> ladyfish grunt white trout are we talking are we talking slipping cork deep is that what you're saying slipping cork deep yeah slip corking was was definitely the ticket once the once the current picked up and started falling out but leading up to it the tides were or the water was really being funky like we'd have a few minutes of it where the corks would move from south to north and then they would all of a sudden start moving west to east and then they would start moving north to south and so when i'm seeing things like that i err on the side of fishing free line and the free line was getting bit way better than the than the cork and then once the once the current decided to to start picking up and doing something consistent then the slip court became the the money maker then so man let's not um yeah sorry sorry to interrupt you i just I, i've been i've been recently um 
in, uh, kind of infatuated with how many new listeners we have been having and how many people that are just now finding the show. Whenever you say slip corking, what exactly are you talking about for our listeners? And kind of just walk us through the setup and, and the goal. You uh, you know, why, why is slip corking a good uh, tactic this time of year and, and for upcoming months? So slip corking or bobber stopping rigs, I've, I hear them called both. It's where you're going to have a piece of thread of, or, or some type of different line than what your main line is made up of. And, and it's and it's tied around your main line so that way you can adjust your depth and so then your so the knot is going to be the maximum depth that your bait can go so then below that this would be the rigging the, the rigging procedure would be to to put your thread on there put your knot on there um and they've got these pre-made threads and there's a company called thill t-h-i-l-l uh, they make a really, really good bobber stopper for me. Um, I, I like one that's really thin, and the beads that come with it have a really, really small hole that you can barely get your line through. But what that allows you to do is that is that knot comes through your guides and into your reel really easy. So you're going to have your knot, your bead, then your slip float, uh, uh, any type of cork that has uh, a way for your line to pass all the way through it. I use Bet's Tackle Billy Boy Bobbers. I use anything from a three, three and a half inch up to a four and a half inch cork. Below that, you're going to have an egg sinker. And you can, some guys like to have a bead underneath the, the cork and then, a, then, then your egg sinker and then another bead. But man, I try to simplify my stuff because when you get broke off, the least amount of uh, gear you got to put back on your main line the the faster you're able to get back in the game for sure Um, and then so then after that it's it's a it's a basic carolina rig so you'll have your egg sinker of say anywhere from three eighths you want to go all the way up to like a three quarter ounce weight then you're going to have you a swivel i recommend a black swivel something small but big enough that's going to be able to hold your hold your uh egg sinker on top of it I think a number 10 is probably about as small as I would go, but in a seven, I think is about as big as I would go. Most of those are rated for probably 50 to 75 pounds, and it's more than enough to do what you're going to do. Below that, I go with either monofilament or fluorocarbon leader, anywhere from as light as 10 pounds to as much. I've gone as high as as, a 60-pound test when uh, when the toothy critters get pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Man, I've really fell in love with using a uh, a, a kale hook. Uh, a one alt kale hook seems to be a, a sweet spot for being able to put that. Uh, you know, be able to use a live shrimp and and heck, heck, actually today we caught a croaker on a shrimp, and then <laughs> put the hook right back through the croaker's nose, threw it out there, and caught a trout on it. Right, I mean, <laughs> immediately. It's a circle so, of life. The, the it? Hook, yeah. Yeah, the hook was uh, hook's definitely big enough for all of that, and then that's your setup. So then you go to your area, your reef, your rig, uh, whatever type of uh, structure that you're wanting to fish. I typically start out uh, measuring my weight from my weight to my knot, and decide my length to, or how deep I want to fish. And most of the time, say for instance, if I'm in 14 feet of water, I'm gonna set at my weight. The, the distance from my weight to my or my swivel my swivel is actually the fixed portion so my swivel to my knot i'm probably going to set it at about 13 feet so from your swivel to your bobber stopper that's right and i'm going to set that one say about 13 feet i'm going to have about 18 inches of uh of leader for my shrimp or my croaker or whatever i'm fishing and then that's that's going to be the setup and now like with me i had the convenience of having Typically, I'm going to have two to as many as four anglers on the boat. You can kind of get that right depth. Yeah. If I'm totally in the blind, I will set all four guys about 18 inches difference and pay attention to whoever catches the first couple of fish and then move probably two of the of the remaining three guys, move them to that depth and make sure it's not an anomaly. And if they start going, then the last guy, we're getting his move down in the same zone. And then we, we should be dialed in there for a little while until 
we get changes of, of tidal movement. So when the tide starts slowing down or speeding up, then you, you kind of have to make some changes along the way. But the reason why it's such a, a good tactic is where, where we're mostly using these slip corks is in areas with a lot of current. And it's going to be where, where we're putting a shrimp or a croaker on the hook, and we're wanting that thing to just drift as naturally as possible with the current. And most of the time, these fish are all going to be oriented where they're facing up current, looking for a meal coming down current. Right. And it's, if you throw it, if you were to put that shrimp on an egg sinker, or some some way to fix it to where it it goes all the way to the bottom and you're just pinning it to the bottom, it's not as a natural of a presentation. And then in, then in that case, you're actually having to wait for the fish to come and find the bait. Whereas the slip cork, you're just feeding line, letting it drift in the current, and you're bringing the bait to the fish, and then you're able to locate covering a lot more ground. Oh though. man! And I mean, I've had I've had days where I maybe quit paying attention to one angler and i look up and i'm like where's your cork and they're like oh it's back there about 200 yards like can't i all right do you see it and they're like yeah i got my eye on it and like all right well if you know where it's at then go ahead and let her drift and and man i've had guys drift almost every ounce of line off the reel and the cork goes down and we're all of a sudden 200 yards away from the structure that we started started fishing and I start moving the boat back to wherever that bite was, and we're now all of a sudden like out in the middle of the bay, and we're slip corking, and there's no structure around, but we just found on a school, school of fish. fish. Oh man, that's cool. Yep. I like the slip talk cork, slip cork talk because I I haven't done that a whole lot to be honest with you. Um, the couple times that I have done it, it's been very it's been very fun and very productive. I remember talking about this last year. You were talking about it, measuring it out. I remember I think it was you and Captain Bobby and Captain Richard all all measured it differently, had different ways to measure it. I got into a pretty heated debate on that. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Somebody was talking about stretching it from the bow of the boat. To That's, the right. Of the boat. That, <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Hey, you got to so, do what you got to uh, do, yeah. right? Well, that brings up a good point. So I will, I will reel my, I will reel the knot up to my rod tip. I'm using seven to maybe seven and a half foot rod, and then I'll pull it. I'll pull the line down around the rod, like the actual butt of the rod, and then double it back. So most of the offshore or or open like bay stuff that we're fishing and around the bridges and stuff, most everything we're going to be using a slip cork for is going to be say like eight feet to maybe as deep as 20 feet deep. So I'll, I'll just measure that. I'll measure my distance uh, based on the r- length of the rod. All you got to do, double it over. You got 14 feet. You need, to, you need to go one more time, triple it over, and you got 21 feet. Yep, and, that um, makes sense. And you're fit. Well, that's great, um, man. That's a great segment. That's a bunch of tips right there in itself. Um, what else? You guys talking about kind of fishing over there on that week space side. Uh, what else have you run into this week? Anything different? Nothing really out of the ordinary. Fished over the weekend with with my wife and and Cooper. My I saw son. that man. Coop tore it up this weekend. Dude, he was on it. He was on it. We we worked uh, we worked docks and and uh, pilings. Just it's uh, it's it can be a little bit frustrating because sometimes these fish are like way up underneath these piers, and you got to make some pretty good casts. But it, at the end of the day, like. You can go out, like I mentioned about not burning a lot of gas today. There's a lot of times where I'll I'll drop the boat in and start fishing almost immediately, and I may I may never crank the motor until I'm ready to go put it on the trailer. Just in just in and out, in and out, fishing fishing uh, dock pilings and broken piers and stuff. And we're seeing uh, man, we ran across quite a few sheephead, and then the redfish were really scattered. Like we never did much more than maybe two or three in one in one area just putting just using split shot and i'm i like a one all i like that one all circle hook by owner the move too light mm-hmm. i really like that hook because uh, most of my anglers especially when we're fishing on the bottom they may not feel that bite that fish can really choke that bait down and still come out with the hook in the corner of his mouth you know really reduce the mortality rates a lot of these you, you may run across these fish that are only 15 inches and need to be thrown back. Or in Cooper's case, he was catching 
28 and 30 inchers and <laughs> we uh we wanted to we wanted to tag those and let them go so so you're beating the docks up with a split shot in a live shrimp that's it huh? and then that um, sounds fun and like, right and right now the um the the trash fish the unwanted are are not terrible so i mean you might have <clears throat> you may end up with 20 or 30 shrimp lost to croakers and maybe a couple of the catfish overall most of our bites were most of them were desired bites and i mean you're not running around you're not running and gunning trying to find something it's just it's probably the closest thing you could do to, to kind of being into bass fishing i've experimented with some lures a, a just a, a gulp or some sort of scented lure uh fish bite stuff like that throwing it out and working on the bottom is it's pretty effective, but I find that it, it kind of cuts down on my bite. It's like I get more, the quality typically goes up. Like I'll usually get some better fish, but I'm, instead of having say 20 or 30 bites in a day, I may only get, may only get four or five. It's a good chance. They're all say 20, 20 inches or better, 25 inches or better or something like that. So been doing that. And then we did, um, we did some nice, uh, we, we landed some really nice trout the other day uh fishing some shallow water stuff man we were i had the guys throwing popping corks and voodoos and they were catching the uh, they were catching little trout like crazy and then we got into another zone where there were some slicks popping up and i had the guys fishing live bait and voodoos man they were just getting croaker to death on their on their shrimp uh, we had a slick pop up and I was like, man, there's got to be some fish in here that are, that are feeding. I mean, the slicks keep popping up and I threw a top water out there and a friggin' 20, 22 inch trout clobbered it. And nice. I was like, all right, that was, uh, that's, that's the clue we needed right there, boys. Yeah. And I got them all set up on top water, taught them how to walk the dog. And every one of them called a, um, caught them a nice trout or or two or three i can't remember what the total number was it wasn't a great it wasn't like a banner catch them you know we weren't catching them every cast but um it was the the quality was there they were all 18 inches and better and a lot of them were showing themselves where they were coming all the way out of the water even if they didn't connect it was still a nice show so that's why that top water is so much fun the visual oh, aspect yeah. of it that's right. And these guys have been fishing. They fished Louisiana and Apalachicola and they fished around here for a while. And, and they're like, man, none of, none of the guys ever let us throw top water. This is so <laughs> cool, man. And uh, I was like, well, it's, you know, I am ducking and diving a little bit, kind of laying low, <laughs> going in the pro right. position sometimes. <laughs> Hiding <laughs> behind the console. <laughs> got to do what you got to do. It was fun and man, super rewarding when a guy tells me this is uh this may be his first ever uh top water speckled trout. So um That's cool. He said he's hooked now. Oh yeah, they had a great time and our uh, our hot bait was the uh the pink pink and silver head and one knocker. Great, great lure, man. It's uh it's one of those that just you just keep it tied on all summer long. It's not it's not gonna it's not gonna let you down if there's a, a fish looking for something to eat on top. Yeah, for sure, man. All right. Well, let's get into the hay cap question. This week's right. hay cap question comes from Thomas Campbell. He says, Hey Cap, what are your go to lures and techniques when power fishing for reds and specks? I'll just go ahead and show my ignorance here. I've never heard power fishing as a term before. Let's define power fishing, and then you can go into your lures and techniques if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, power fishing is just is really just going to be when you're when you get on a stretch of water. I mean, real really common to what the tactics where we were fishing slow, we were fishing live bait around these docks and and broken wharfs and stuff. If you if you exchange a live bait for something artificial you can really you can really power fish those areas pretty good throw in anything that you can that you can keep the boat moving and just keep casting and burn and bringing the bait back to you you can do it real well with top water a lot of times you can work work really really fast and just get a reaction strike out of them and then you can slow down and fish that area and then you can throw things like uh, lip crank bait uh, like a stick bait, maybe like a XR8 or a bomber, bomber, um, bomber, uh, a, oh my gosh, I'm showing my bomber ignorance all of a sudden. <laughs> a, uh, 
I don't uh, know. I don't know anyway, the names of bombers. A, <laughs> God, but anyway, like a stick bait uh, with like a two, you know, a two hook, something that's going to dive down, say about three to six feet deep. You can power fish those pretty good. Uh, so you're just, you can you're throw. Just, uh, you're just turning and burning and trying to find fish. Basically, is what power fishing you, is. Yeah, it's you're. You are not, I mean, I've, I've mentioned this before. You're not looking for the hard to please fish. You're looking for a gullible fish. You're wanting, yeah. you're trying to find a fish that, that's sitting on a, you know, on a oyster shells or a piling or something where you, when you rip this bait by it, all the, it doesn't even think about it. Yeah. You know, like getting up in the grass beds and stuff for redfish, throwing spinner baits, uh, wake baits bomber makes a jointed wake minnow that we were throwing the other day you got to slow down a little bit for that bait but you can still pretty you can still be pretty much a power fisherman and but it's it's really about just covering water and just trying to pick a zone that instead of saying all right well you know i saw it like for instance you may go to a shoreline or a, or a um or a stretch of water that you're seeing just mullet everywhere you know mm-hmm. you're looking at you're, it's not you're like necessarily, to take all the clues. it's not necessarily a point that you're honing in on or something that's right you take a you take a quote-unquote fishy area and just go from you know it might be a 200 yard stretch hell it might be a half a mile stretch and you right. just drop it start fishing and take a look when you're fishing you see a you see a different looking swirl than a mullet make your make sure you're burning a cast through there uh, but the main thing is, is just having a lure that you that you can be in control of. Uh, we love our slick lures, but I don't. It's pretty difficult to fish a slick lure in a power fishing sense. But yeah. what it might do is you may come through there, ripping a top water on top and get a good blow up. Turn around and throw a few more times, and it doesn't react. And then that's when you could throw a to, uh, a, a slick in there and possibly get that big bite that the fish showed itself briefly, but then. Then you give it something that looks gets right in its face, and then it eats it. Yeah, or a few fish gave themselves away. I'm sure you could find schools that way, same way. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, I've had it happen where you get you get one blow up on top water, and you may not you may go throw through there ten more times with a top water, and you're like, well, maybe they're not here, and then all of a sudden you throw uh, you throw something subsurface at them, and you get them, but you were power fishing when you when you found them you right know? whenever they gave themselves away that's a great that's a great hey cap question man that's a great that's a great yep. explanation i do like that question that's a great one all right that's a great hey cap question thomas is going to get a prize pack from the slick lure thomas campbell make sure you email us at alabama at bestfishingreport.com with your shipping address and we'll make sure we get you those slick lures you guys make sure you're following best fishing report on facebook and make sure you join our alabama saltwater fishing report private group for good stuff we're always putting on there captain patrick uh, i know i mentioned kind of in the first of this segment kind of going into the slip cork thing i've been trying to kind of reintroduce our, our contributors because so many new folks are finding the show uh for different areas so i'm just kind of trying to reintroduce people so kind of tell us a little bit about your company and a little bit about yourself man kind of give us a fifty thousand foot view of uh patrick garmison and ugly fishing and how to get in touch with you well i appreciate that butch i think about it uh think about it a good bit when i listen to a podcast and i listen to it i'm like man i don't really know who that guy was and <laughs> gotta know That's so anyway, gotta know. yeah i've been raised here in, in alabama area for i am now 40 years old so i've been fishing around here for Dang, about you know, 35 okay. years yeah i know it about <laughs> 35 years i've been been wetting a line in the in the mobile bay area i uh, got my guide license 11 years ago been full-time guiding now going into my sixth year i run ugly fishing kind of a catchy name people remember it I got a cool logo my buddy andy hayes drew for me fish all over mobile bay i fish the delta east side of the bay west side of the bay all in the middle fish mississippi sound to do some near shore fishing so there's not a whole lot of a lot of fish or fish types that i don't harass at some point in time during the year i know that's true what kind of boat yeah so i'm running a 24 foot blue wave it's a pure bay it's a 2021 version so it's a She's a she's a pretty new vessel, powered with a 300 Yamaha, and got a uh, motor guide 
uh, XI-5 trolling motor on there and dual power poles, so uh, rigged out pretty good. And then with a 12-inch uh, Axiom Pro uh, uh, Ray Marine fish finder, not a whole lot of not a whole lot of toys on the boat that are uh, that are missing. You know, got a lot of stuff running uh, loose equipment uh, as far as uh, fishing reels and rods and the inshore series stuff and. And I like I like to think that I that I go out of my way to make sure I have good equipment and 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 high quality tools at my disposal. So, you know, when a customer gets on the boat, we having a breakdown of some sort is uh, should be a very you know very limited happenings. You know, every every once in a while you may have a rod break or a reel malfunction or something like that. But for the most part, they're pretty seamless trips. Oh, and yeah. uh, I like to think it's a lot of a lot to do with the fact that I choose I choose the good quality equipment to. Yeah, to and take you got to keep up with it too. You got to keep care of your stuff. I mean, that's your office. Yep, it is. You'll break a you'll break a few rods every now and again. You'll have that on them big jobs. Yep, it happens, man. <laughs> and you'll have people that all of a sudden just goes haywire or or power pole know. that made something you never know battery right. go bad and, uh, something something bound to happen eventually but if i if i feel like if i stay in good stuff i'm gonna be in i'm, I'm gonna be in good shape those, heck those yeah events. that's yeah. a fact well if folks want to get up with you and book a trip what's the best way to get in touch with you, cap the best thing to do is go to uglyfishing.com click the book now and that'll take you to my calendar and then you'll be able to first off you'll be able to see the open dates that i have and then uh and unfortunately a lot of customers are seeing how how few of those days those actually are that's that's the easiest way to find me and my information but if you want to give me a call or shoot me a text you got some questions or comments or or uh or whatever you want to talk through what you what you got in mind as far as a fishing trip then do that give me a call shoot me a text at 251 757-1554. Seven four seven one five five four. Awesome, buddy. We appreciate the report. That's a great hey cap question and answer. And uh we always look forward to hearing from you next time, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, Butch. Y'all have a good one, man. Appreciate it. All right, that's another great segment. Let's take a quick break and hear from a few of this week's sponsors. That segment was brought to us by Test Calibration. If your diesel has low power or is consuming excessive amounts of fuel, these are common signs that your turbocharger may need to be rebuilt. Don't waste your money online with the cheapest options where you get no support after the sale. Test Calibration has been selling and servicing diesel, turbochargers, and fuel injection systems since 1976. No matter if you're running a diesel in your boat, tractor, or truck, Test Calibration can help you. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. And also brought to us by Advanced Transmission. Give the professionals a call who have been trusted on the Gulf Coast for over 25 years at 251-626-6061 or check them out online at www.advanced-transmission.com. All right, guys. Uh, we've been really excited to release this segment for you guys to listen to. It's a really cool product that we're kind of pumped about. We've been trying some things out. Uh, we had a really cool interview with Nathan Garrison over at Shark Bands, and that's going to be the next segment coming up. It's going to be our offshore segment this week, so you guys please uh, check them out at sharkbands.com and enjoy this interview. All right, Joe, I'm pretty excited about our next segment, man. I was sitting in the office not too long ago, and I got a press release like you and I get a, a good bit of. And this one kind of hit home for me, man. I got a uh, Shark Bands, B-A-N-Z. And the one I got in particular is called a Zeppelin Shark Deterrent Tackle. It looks just like an egg weight kind of, man, a little oblong egg weight. And I thought, you know, that would be very applicable for for all of our listeners. So I reached out to Mr. Nathan Garrison. He's the co-founder and director of sales and marketing over at Shark Bands. I figured we could have him on. How are we doing today, Nathan? Hey guys, great to be here with you, Joe and and uh, and Butch. It's awesome to to connect with y'all and, and share with your listeners about this new technology. Yeah, man, we are really excited to uh, get into it and see how this thing works and what applications. And now you guys have a few different products um, that works that work around in different applications for things that our our guys and gals are going to be doing. So let's just get into it. Where you want to start at, Joe? Man, you know, Butch. You and I did a good bit of surfing when we were coming up together. We did some wade fishing. You've gotten into diving. I got dive certified. Diving's not for me, but you've really gotten into diving. All the offshore fishing we've done. Sharks are not getting less prevalent. No. I think there's more sharks now out there than there's ever been. And I wonder if 
attacks. It seems like you hear more about shark attacks, but you hear more about everything with the te- you know media and technology where it is. So that's where I'd like to start, Nathan. I mean, you know, are shark attacks increasing? Is there any data to support that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've, I've got plenty of shark stories. I'm sure you guys have plenty to share too. I, I look forward to learning a bit about that from you. But shark attacks are are definitely increasing and have been doing so really since the 50s. And and I know you guys uh, do a lot of data-driven research for this podcast, so I can definitely share some interesting data on the subject with you. And not only are shark attacks on people increasing, but uh, also the statistics on shark bite-offs for fishermen as well. And that's really been in the last 10 years that that's exponentially increased. It's gone pretty crazy, not just here in the U.S. and the Gulf and on the East Coast, but all across the world from Australia to South Africa. So, um, yeah, that's why our products are here is to help reduce the risk for ocean goers, also for uh, fishermen to, to reduce the incidence of shark bite off. Hey, man, I don't need your fancy data sets to tell me <laughs> we getting we, we getting bit off more down here now a, a lot more a lot yeah. more that is bad it's really bad i mean to the point where you're just you're just moving i mean it's it seemed like that would happen well i'll, I'll put it put it into perspective you know butch when you and i were in our teenage years and we were deckhanding a lot it was kind of like the cool thing when you got a snapper that got bit in half you know you're like ha, it makes a cool picture but that didn't mm-hmm. happen that much I mean, it definitely wasn't a daily thing. I'd say it's a daily thing now. It's terrible, really. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, like black blackfin fishing, you know, you're just dropping straight down with jigs, uh, red snapper fishing. I mean, you're usually, more times than not, I would say you're trying to reel that fish up as quick as possible so it doesn't get shark bit. You think, you think that's, that's extreme, you think, or no? I, no, not at all. I mean, you talk, you even talk to the guys on the piers. I mean, they're, they're, they've got, like, strategies for how to – let the king mackerel they're free spooling you know while they got a king mackerel on to get it away from the shark i mean it's a bad yeah. situation they're having they're actually you know on the pier they're having those special shark days where you can trying to beat them back a little out. bit you know yeah. and and that's just getting sharked i mean <laughs> you and i did quite a bit of surfing quite a bit of weight fish i mean i there were some close calls with me and you on the surfboard uh, oh yeah yeah i mean we yes. weren't on the same surfboard that would have been a little weird but you know, yeah. I do know. <laughs> yeah, what you I mean. wondered about that from you guys. If you'd, <laughs> if you'd had any close calls or had yourself or any friends get bitten when you were surfing back in the day. Thank goodness have... not bitten, but man, I, I mean, I remember one time in particular, Butch, you know, you and I were like waiting on a set to come in and I don't know how big was that bull shark that just, just came right in between us. Like 350, 400. Yeah. I've seen several of them out there surfing. I've actually been knocked off my board before, but nobody's ever been bitten that I've been surfing with. Not yet. Knocked off your board <laughs> counts as definitely a sketchy encounter. So yeah, you're, encounter, you're on brother, the list. Sure. Yeah. A lot of, uh, in some lists that might be considered an attack, you just didn't get bit. So you're a statistic now. Yeah. I mean, all that being said, though, you guys, you guys are doing some pretty cool stuff. And I have, you know, haven't been able to get out and test this yet. But why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about the Shark Bands technology? Because I think that if it's as described, this is pretty much a game changer. It's a game changer. Uh, when it comes to, definitely when it comes to getting sharked and also with that peace of mind for those guys that are maybe going to go wade fishing or, or do spear fishing. Let's just talk about that a little bit. So tell us about shark bands. For sure. Yeah. I mean, going back to what you just said about having that huge bull shark come in between you guys. I had a close friend when we were like 18, 19, he got, attacked by a bull shark off of uh, Folly Beach, South Carolina, which is where I grew up, and ripped him off his board, pulled him underwater, tore up his leg, you know, was really his ankle pretty bad. And that wasn't even that big of a shark, but big enough to do some some significant damage. You know, he made a full recovery. He's fine, but, you know, I kind of looked at the ocean a bit differently after that. And then after that, you know, it, it became, okay, every time I'm going to go surfing in certain areas, I'm going to be thinking about this. And my dad and I, after, you know, uh, he's a lifelong diver. He used to be a dive instructor in, in Monterey, California in the seventies, you know, back with the, <laughs> with the big great whites and in that cold water, I still am in total admiration so, of, of him doing that. That was sketchy. Yeah. <laughs> we just had enough conversations about it. We're like, man, like there's gotta be 
a way that we can come up with something that's simple, affordable, stylish, and is obviously effective that can reduce the risk for people when they're in the water. Because, you know, even if it makes me like 10, 20% less likely to get bit than the guy next to me, or if I'm out there by myself and it doesn't impact performance, then like, why wouldn't I wear it? So we looked around at different technologies and we figured out that there's this magnetic technology that had been discovered and developed by a group of marine biologists and chemists back in 2005 that could deter a whole range of different shark species from uh, from their prey or, or from a, a target item. And they worked on that with a, a number of different scientists who, who then expanded upon that research around the world. And there was a pretty good body of research papers that suggested that we could create a product for people out of this magnetic technology. So basically what it does is it, it, you use these really powerful permanent magnets that generate an electromagnetic field that disrupts a shark's electrical sense in a way that's highly unpleasant for it. So even for us humans, we can't really perceive that that field is there, but to a shark, it has this sensory organ that you guys are probably familiar with called the ampullae of Lorenzini. When you look at a shark's snout, it's all those little dots, like look like little pores, like blackheads. And it uses those to detect really weak electrical fields in the water. And that's how they hunt and navigate. And that's how they see in the dark. And near this magnetology, it creates an unpleasant sensation in that snout organ by overstimulating it. So it tells them basically that, hey, this isn't might be dangerous. Leave it alone. It's kind of like work principle that, you know, wild animals will follow the past path of this and to get and if something they believe is harmful, you know, if they, they get injured in the wild, they're going to go somewhere else to look for a meal so they avoid it. Sure. Does this work for anything else other than sharks, Nathan? Yes. Only animals that it works on are uh, stingrays, which are like cousins of sharks. So it's maybe it's slightly effective on stingrays and there's less research just to be like totally upfront, but it definitely has an effect on them as well, especially if with the more powerful product, like, like our fishing products, um, you can shoe off a, a stingray from, from a pretty close range with that one. Yeah. I think I like I think, that application a lot. I hate stingrays. I think I'm more worried about stingrays when I'm like weight fishing or absolutely uh, even surfing to some extent. I think I'm more worried about stingrays than I'm sharks. And mm -hmm. I mean, if they got, yeah, that, have you guys ever been hit by one? Not yet, but I'm not really looking forward to, <laughs> Joe, Joe and I were wade fishing off the south tip of Sand Island one time and uh you know in the Gulf of Mexico right right down south of uh, Mobile and he threw over my line so he kind of hooked up lures and we reeled mm -hmm. in together and we're sitting there together undoing it and one bumped my foot and of course I did the, the, the stupidest thing possible I just jumped <laughs> straight up in the air yeah. he, he, the jumped, he, jumped, he jumped right into my strong arms and I carried him all the way to the <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't remember how it ended up but that's fine if that's if that's what happened that's good because I was scared the crap out of yeah me, i mean i heard i mean those the stingrays have that lorenzo llamas thing he was talking about <laughs> too, you know the, uh, <laughs> uh, no, i kid i kid no but i mean man you talk about i mean golly man some of the days out there some of the days out there it's i've when i've been wade fishing i'm literally just sitting there going like when am i gonna get hit mm -hmm. because there's so many of They're them everywhere i mean yeah. you're taking like little old woman steps you're not even mm -hmm. steps little old woman shuffles you know just, shuffles yeah, and they're just, they're just shuffling them around. around yeah takes you yeah. takes you 10 minutes to get back to the shore to get out to where you want to get to just to, just to get up to your waist because you're shuffling so slow no doubt so you think you think the zeppelin would be better for that wade fishing application as far as sharks for your extremities as well as your stringer and those stingray, how would you use the Zeppelin for that? Yeah, I mean, basically we've got two products, right? So we've got a wearable product that's just the, the standard shark bands that we've had for the last six years. And that you can wear on your wrist, your ankle. It's one size fits all. There's no batteries. There's no charging. You literally just get it, strap it on like a watch on your wrist or ankle and boom, it's, it's always working for you. You don't ever have to worry about charging it. It's just, you know, simple maintenance like every once in a while just rinse it with some fresh water don't leave it in super hot car and that's really all there is to it and anybody can use that that spends time in the ocean whether you're you know 
going to visit a couple times a year or whether you're a seasoned spear fisherman or diver that's just there for you to help reduce the risk um, it's got an effective range of like three to six feet so it's a short range device it doesn't affect any other fish no other animals just sharks and stingrays so whether you're you know you're out spear fishing or whether you're just surfing and you're trying to avoid 350 pound bull sharks as your friend in the lineup <laughs> amen if uh if they come up to you they'll sense that feel like i talked about and they'll just they'll understand hey like that's maybe not something i should mess with and they'll turn around and, and leave you alone and then the other product is the zeppelin which we just came out with with in the last couple months um just got went up in stock last week and that is uh it's a terminal tackle it's the world's first shark deterrent tackle it's designed to replace your sinker or go in tandem with a sinker if you're deep dropping and, and need a bit more weight and it, it sits about you want you want to rig it so it sits about 24 to 30 inches below the tail of the target fish species and you can use it for bottom fishing and as you're reeling up, the shark will come and encounter that device before it makes it to the fish and boom, they turn around and you, you won't believe it, but go watch the videos. And, you know, we've got a number of big time captains on board and in, in the keys where it's, it's a huge shark depredation issue. And as you said, like they're calling it a game changer and, you know, that's their words, not mine. So really excited to, to see where that goes and, and help fishermen like you guys reduce that problem that you're having so much with sharks biting your fish. I think that this, the Zeppelin, like you're talking about where you are able to rig it in line, especially from bottom fishing applications is that makes a lot of sense because you're already using a bank sinker in a lot of cases or, or an egg sinker to fish. And this can somewhat replace that because it's about what, six and a half ounces or so. Yeah, exactly. Six and a half ounces. And it's about five times as powerful as the shark bands band so you know it's being asked to to do a bit of a heavier to carry a bit of a heavier load than the shark bands product because you're actually trying to stop a shark from eating its favorite prey right in front of its face you know, it's going 20 miles an hour so it just rigs up like that right below it and yeah you'll you'll check out the video and they come in and boom they take off and and it is yeah it's multifunctional like you said you know you can you can just replace your sinker with it six and a half ounces and we looked at so many different applications for what the first product would be, right? Like we get all these guys running into us for years saying, man, like you got to help us with the tuna fishing. You know, I'm getting crushed on bottom fishing. And you know, we, we tried to make something that's the lowest hanging fruit, right? Like most people are getting shark most frequently bottom fishing. So we went after that market first and we, this is why we're, we're talking to guys like you because, Hey, like we want to be able to address these other problems that you're having where sharks are taking tunas and other pelagics and want to be able to help there too. And, and we're working on that stuff. So we, we welcome feedback from anybody who, who wants to assist with that. Nathan, is this technology kind of, a, is it a cumulative thing where, well, you know, like obviously you're saying that the effective range of this thing's about, about three feet, right? Yeah, three to six feet. I mean, you'll okay. definitely, the animals can sense it as far as like 10 feet away, but they can't sense it beyond that because I could go into like the laws of magnetics about why, but yeah, we're not going to do all that. No, yeah. no we, don't need, <laughs> yeah. we don't need to know all that. Yeah. Three to six uh, feet. That's what you're going to go to the yeah. shark bands website. If you want to read Nathan can, you can nerd out over there. We're not going to let you do that on this show, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, man, I'll I'm, I'll just, I'm just fooling with, you know, the, um, so is this something where like, if I got like a vest, you know, and put like 20 of these things in here that I'm going to be able to repel a good bit further. And the reason I'm joking about that is like, these things would make a pretty good dive weight is what I was thinking. I mean, you're already using a dive belt. Is this something where if you've got more of them that it, it works further? Or is it just going to be three to six feet within, even if there was two of them or three of them, you know, if I had one in every pocket or something. You could make a necklace no, that's, out of it. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm already thinking about, you know? That's a good question. Your necklace concept, you probably have a, a bit of an issue with that because as I don't know if you've got more than one on either of you, but if you have two of these things next to each other, they are extremely powerful magnets. Oh, They're nice. not like anything you've experienced before. They're the same type of magnets that get used in like Tesla motors and like, you know, electric cars and stuff. So they're heavy duty, serious things so that might be your your issue in trying to use a bunch of them but to answer your question is sort of uh to an extent you can increase 
the field size, but it's more like you're just increasing the strength of the field and the intensity of it. Just again, like the laws of magnetics, like I was saying, you can't really can't go increase the range, right. but you're just increasing the intensity at a short at a short range. So, you know, for the shark bands, for certain activities, like people who are ocean swimming, if, especially if they're in like a fairly sharky area, we'll tell them, hey, like wear one on the wrist, one on the ankle, it provides better coverage. You know, if, you, if you're really worried about it, it's not definitely not going to hurt you. It'll only help you. You know, same thing with the Zeppelin. You know, we haven't tried to use more than one on a line yet. But like if you're spearfishing or something, you can have one that you up that would like go on your stringer. And then you could like wear a shark pins on your ankle. And like that would, that would help you. That's a good yeah. idea. I think that makes a lot of sense for wade fishing because mm -hmm. quite often you're wade fishing and you get a bull shark that comes up and you know, noses your stringer, maybe has a little snack and hopefully he's, he's not nosing you. But if you've got both of those things covered, then you can just kind of relax and mm -hmm. it's a shuffle free environment. Um, so put a, put a, uh, I still recommend doing some shuffling, uh -uh, but we... no, I'll be high stepping out there now. I got the shark, <laughs> shark bands. Just... Damn you. Yeah, shark bands. Like the... You know, I'm, gonna, I'm sitting on the, <laughs> sitting on the beach with this big spine in my foot no no man i mean this is just nathan really... said i could do it right yeah <laughs> where's that disclaimer That's and right. like you said this magnet's crazy i mean i'm looking at the the case that this thing came in and is there any considerations with like this magnet and electronics like do you need to worry about having this next to your phone or next to any marine electronics or anything like that I'm going to sterilize Yeah, it. good good question. <laughs> yeah, that's, does, why we, yeah. that's why it comes in that case because the case is magnetically shielded and that will prevent it from damaging any other electronics. So it's a, as long as it's like at least a foot away, it's it's okay from stuff like phones and, and computers and things like that. But generally, you know, we just tell people to start in the case when you're not using it. And really the main thing that, that you have to worry about with the magnets is like hard disk memory, like you know, memory cards, you know, hard drives, things like that. Mm. That's obviously like the, the things you really don't want to damage and they are like the most vulnerable to magnets. So those hotel just, keys, you know, those hotel cards, those things always. Get yeah. Them you out. can wipe a card. I haven't had a credit card go bad ever for them. <laughs> I mean, you know, we've sold a lot of these things and in, you know, seven years I've only had, I think I can recall three incidences where somebody's had an issue with an electronic device. So it's super rare. Like it's not really something to get that worried about. It's just something to be mindful of for sure. For sure. Yeah. The case is super fancy. I like the packaging a lot. What, yeah. We're working what? on some like ways to slim it down too. And it's, it's just a little tricky with shipping and stuff. Cause there's actually quite a bit of regulation around shipping magnets internationally, for, especially if you put them on an airplane. Yeah, I'm sure. What I'm seeing with this, Joe, like for you to weigh in here, you know, you got a 23 or a 27 foot boat. Uh, most of them have a midship cleat. What mm -hmm. if you put like some, <clears throat> I mean, I would say that most, I don't even know what we're going to call it, sh get, get, getting sharked. Most of your fish getting eating off, eaten off the line are going to be, you know, pretty much six to 12 feet away. Wouldn't you say coming up to the boat? Um, Is that where it happens to you guys? In all this stuff that I've you know, we went to Western Australia, did a bunch of, of testing out there. That's kind of where we first d determined, okay, like these are the, the products that we're going to finalize. Like we took a bunch of prototypes and, and put them through the paces. And most of the time we were getting sharked, it was within the first 50 feet after the, the hookup. And then same thing in the Keys. Like when we've done a bunch of the testing there, we actually haven't had them like chasing us in the last 20 to 30 feet of water is that what's happening where you guys are at because that'd be a bit different than what i've seen so far well i mean you know you got to be careful doing your testing in australia you know everything's different over there like their toilets flush in the opposite direction that's right so, <laughs> yeah. everything's um, backwards down, no, down i mean i don't i don't know that everything's really... trying to kill you you're right. right yeah i mean so it, i would say if it works you guys want to hear about a crazy thing in australia that i found out about that, that can kill you that i didn't hear of before when i was always. there it's no, like, always good to know absolutely. i want to know about everything that can kill me that's so very avoid all, death. all right that's a good death. policy to have i want to know about everything that could try to kill me yeah. so in australia there's like they call they have these little cockle shells they're like you know like the small little spiral shell that you'd see like maybe an inch or two tall like this small beautiful looking shell you're like oh what a cool shell like i'll just pick that up put it in my pocket and take it home well 
there's a, a creature that hides in a lot of these shells and it doesn't have like a like a you know like snails and stuff they have like a door so you can like a hermit crab you can like see that there's something in there well yeah, this thing right. it doesn't have a, a little door so you don't even know that it's in there but it's like slithered up inside and it has this little little foot and a stinger on it and it comes out and it'll prick you if it's in your pocket or in your hand or something like that and you'll die in 15 minutes from this why thing. do you see no i don't want to hear this i don't even know that i need to know we're gonna edit that I'm, out i'm gonna be just, sleep, i'm gonna be sleeping my with shell, my shark bands tonight crying myself to sleep <laughs> i'm just gonna be sitting there like i'm never going to australia now i, I was like man just when i thought i've seen it it all like like even the little sweet shell on the beach that i pick up and take to my girlfriend's gonna kill me murder fest <laughs> yeah. right. have uh, you guys ever heard of mud crabbing before well no <laughs> oh okay this was a ridiculous thing that they have in western australia so you know a mangrove swamp which is pretty much like one of the least pleasant places that you'd want to be in anyways oh yeah the the guys in West Oz, they get really excited about this mud crabbing because apparently these mud crabs are unbelievable tasting, but they are so serious. So you, you go out in the middle of the mangrove forest, sometimes at night, sometimes in the day. They only go at night sometimes because it's like snipe hunting. You know, it's like, it's only like a wild wonder- goose chase. Is what yeah. it sounds it's, like. a, it's only 90 degrees at night instead of 110 <laughs> during the day. And you go in the mangroves and these huge mud crab make these holes and you either stick in the hole. And then when you find you stick your hand in the hole, some of these guys and try to pull them out and they have claws, like a stone crab on steroids and they can cut your finger off like (laughs) immediately. No, Good I'm never going. I'm, by the way, Nathan, I'm never going anywhere with you. We are not travel buddies. Yeah. You can, uh, you count me out on the mud crab. And that sounds like the crazy people down here to do the noodling. Yeah. Well, they, it's, yeah. Yes. It's similar to that, but it's like, I don't know. To did do you, did you actually, did you actually see one of these mud crabs? Cause I really feel like they were like, Hey, watch this. Watch what we're going to yeah. do with this. Let's watch what we're going to do to this guy. <laughs> well, yeah. They I, dragged, I they dragged us on this mud crabbing trip and I was like, all right, fine. I'll go. And, yeah, all everything I just said was was to a T. One hundred ten degrees in the mangrove swamp, in the mud, and they we got one. We only found one, and we ate it. And the damn thing was delicious, but I don't know if I can say it <laughs> not was worth, worth it. it. Oh man! Well, yeah, what, what, this, this is very cool technology. I mean, uh, it, well, I hold on now. I want to finish. I want to finish my my thought. So what I was saying about the Zeppelin, twenty three or twenty seven foot boat, and yes, I do think that I do think the last probably 30 or 40 feet is where we get shark the most. You don't think so, Joe? I just don't know that I could say, I, I, I don't think I've ever really, I definitely think, I definitely think with tuna fishing that we get sharked seems like right by the boat or that's where the fish starts getting chased. Yeah. I but could that see that. Yeah. Seems like. tuna fishing. Bottom, but fishing, in the bottom fishing too. I don't know. I don't think I've ever really paid that close attention. I've just been like crap, stupid, stupid sharks. Yeah. yeah. So what I, I was thinking was, you could put this thing on, you know, 500 pound test, and crimp it onto that, say a 30 foot leader, crimp it onto that cleat, crimp it onto the Zeppelin and toss it overboard, put one off the port side and one off the starboard side. If you were to try that application, Nathan, I mean, is this, is it going to be basically a six foot sphere of, of influence, so to speak? Yeah, exactly. But you can kind of hit or miss yeah. as to whether or not. And that would be a tough one. guy with, wanted with to hang that. out by the shark bands with your. Yeah, it's best to definitely just keep it in the line. Or actually, you know, we had a captain, uh, Farner. I'll have to double check that. Tampa, and he was worried about getting it snagged in the bottom. So he mm-hmm. he was just there getting sharked on on grouper fishing all day. It's like, man, let me try this thing. So he put it on a on a second rod and dropped it down at the bow of the boat, and then had some bottom fishing on the stern once he hooked up he walked the line with the zeppelin on it from the bow back to the stern then they reeled up at the same pace (laughs) and they landed every fish after that apparently and limited on groupers for the day after they started doing that wow so that's just another way to do it yeah, Joe, you can be my uh, escort for my fish with the shark bands. Yeah. Great. I'm your shark <laughs> Yeah, shark you can switch boy. off. That's right. One shark person fishes, yeah. one person repels the sharks. Yeah, that's right. I could, I could go see that going day. really well. Hey, you, 
Go get up here with that shark bands. I got a fish on. <laughs> no, over here. Hey, bring bring me some more bait while you're at it. <laughs> Oh man, that's cool stuff. I really, really, really like it for like I was saying the wade fish application for stingrays as well as sharks. I'm looking forward to trying it, and I'm definitely. I gonna, really look forward to trying it. It doesn't work, Nathan. I'm totally going to find your house. So. <laughs> oh yeah, come yeah. Uh. <laughs> you got him scared. Now. Right? He's, he's like, like, he's like, wait a minute. Yeah, no, it's it works. Yeah, we we've tested it. I, no, I mean it's awesome, man. It sounds like you guys have put it through the ringer with these guys in the keys and put it through with some guys that are dealing with this problem. I can't wait to get this thing out in the Gulf and give it a shot. I mean, if folks want to look it up and, and maybe pick one up for any of these applications we're talking about, what, where should they go? Where can they get more information? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you guys just know that it wouldn't be out there and have the, the approval of the captains that we've worked with. You know, if these guys weren't saying that it worked, like it, we wouldn't be putting it out there. And you know, that every step of the process that we've done in developing this has been in conjunction with guys who are, you know, big time saltwater fishermen to make it as convenient to use and, and as effective as possible. And, you know, if we weren't, you know, in, in Exmouth, Australia, where, you know, the sharks are as bad as anywhere, we showed like a 80 plus percent reduction in shark bite off compared to the norm. So, wow. and then in the keys, like we went from, you can't land a fish on a particular day without it to, you know, landing every fish after that. So, you know, I feel I'm super confident in it and I, I invite people to, to try it out and it's really just comes down to rigging it right. Like if you rig it right and you have it two feet below that fish, once you've caught it, it's going to be highly effective. So, you know, and I'm just, I'm excited to see how different captains and fishermen figure out new ways to use this thing because you know they you know you guys are the guys that are out there every day doing this and i know that y'all are smart and you're you know y'all are all macgyver types and you'll figure out ways to to make it even even more effective and and to use it so i'm i'm excited for that you know it's only the beginning and uh, and yeah if people want to want to find it read more about it like you can watch the videos yeah, go to sharkbands.com that's shark b a n z .com and you can watch all the videos, you can read about the technology, you can see testimonials from captains like Billy Delph and Chris Mandola down in Key West. And we're going to start working with some guys up in uh, North Carolina pretty soon and, and would love to get some some folks from uh, y'all's region of North Florida and, and Alabama on board too. And yeah, maybe we can connect at one of the big fishing tournaments or something that you guys have coming up this summer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, man. That uh, or, fishing or, rodeo. Hey, you know, looks anytime like a you want to come time. on the boat and just be the, you can be the shark bands guy. I'll do the fishing. That's right. And you can escort our fish up. That'd be great. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's Nathan, awesome. you good for me anyway. Open, open invite. It'd be fun. Yeah. Well, Nathan, no man, it's, it's been good. Appreciate you talking a little bit with us about, uh, you know, how to avoid shark attacks and some of the different uh, applications for the shark bands technology. Folks, y'all head on over to their website for more information. All right, guys, that wraps up another great segment. You guys check out our sponsors. That segment was brought to us by SunSouth. If your to-do list requires work on the land, come see us at SunSouth. We listen to your needs so you get the right equipment and the right implements at a price you can afford. And during our spring sales event, you can save even more on quality John Deere equipment at SunSouth with 0% financing on select models like zero-turn mowers and compact utility tractors. For John Deere equipment sales, parts, and service, come see us at SunSouth. Equipment for those that do. Some restrictions apply. See dealer for details. Expires May 31, 2021. And also brought to you by Alabama Marine Resources. The Alabama Marine Resources Division reminds all recreational anglers who harvest great trigger fish, greater amberjack, or red snapper that their catch must be reported through Snapper Check. This includes vessels, kayaks, and shore anglers who possess any of these reef fish. Reporting is mandatory and must be done prior to landing fish in Alabama, regardless of where the fish were caught. Anglers can report to Snapper Check online at outdooralabama.com or through the official Outdoor AL app. For more information about Snapper Check or any of the 2021 fish seasons please visit outdooralabama.com all right folks let's head on down to our surf report let's see what captain dusty hayes is up to what you say cat what you been doing this week oh man been uh fighting this rain for sure it's, it's weather likes to be nasty on the days i'm off for sure it wants to keep me off the water but luckily i have got it got out there a few times and 
out on the beach and we caught it got some good fish uh for sure still a decent little pompano bite still a decent whiting bite hardtails are super thick a couple weeks ago it was the cow nose rays everybody's hooking into them and fighting them for 30 minutes up and down the beach and now it's the hardtails but constant action um i noticed the first hour after daylight when that sun kind of gets up those hardtails kind of get out in that deeper water with the bait and then you that's usually when you'll pick up your pompano and whiting bite i've got to that point in the year you know i know further to the east it's a little different but as far as like the orange beach gulf shores Fort morgan area you know i try to keep a variety of baits go shrimp and regular shrimp fish bites of course and, and then even sand fleas you notice there's always kind of a transition point where it seems like one day one thing's working better than another but it's also kind of goes weekly and normally go shrimp is a killer and i mean it definitely caught some fish this year but um, i don't think that you know i i guess we just had a good enough run where go shrimp wasn't a necessity like it is sometimes and i know in the winter and especially early season the guys with go shrimp are always doing doing better than everybody else but uh, a lot of good fish caught on, you know, shrimp, fish bites, and all that stuff this time of year, or this year, this spring. And uh, the sand fleas, you know, produce for a lot of people so far. But me personally, it seems like that first week of May is really when I start seeing more sand fleas. Uh, I'm able to catch them and use them. And, um, you know, I'll catch a few here and there and might pick up a fish. But the past, I'd say, 10 days or so, pretty much so far in May, I've had a really good consistent bite on sand fleas whether it's you know both whiting uh and the pompano so and we've actually caught some pompano on really big sand fleas which i don't i don't care to use the huge ones but i'll put a couple out there anyways just for the hell of it and uh mm-hmm. and we picked up some some good bites on those too so um that's that's going down for sure and if you want to walk the beach and throw lures for you know i know everybody watches matthew throw big poppers and stuff for jacks and redfish and it's prime time right now especially down fort morgan and all that there's the redfish and jacks are all over the place and you know guys catching them off the pier same thing uh you know i had the school of jacks come in on me two weeks ago two fridays ago i was out there and i saw some bait kind of scurrying and and I saw some stuff come up. I was like, ah, that's not Spanish. And uh, I had the fly rod in my hand and laid a fly out in there a couple good times. And I was throwing real small clouds when they were chasing L-Y's probably eight inches long. So they weren't worried about my little clouds here. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, there's there's all kinds of activity, you know. We haven't really had super hot weather. It's actually been, other than the rain and the wind, it's been fairly pleasant temperature-wise. So it's kind of kept that activity level up and kept all this stuff schooling around and uh, lots of Spanish, uh, bluefish, all that stuff on various lures like poppers and spoons and all that stuff. It's just about everybody's catching Spanish from the jetties to the pier, all that stuff. So we've really had a <clears throat> pretty killer spring surf-wise. And now that the temps are kind of warming up and we've had all this freshwater influx, uh, a lot of the trout are moving out on the beach side, you know, everything from Fort Morgan to Orange Beach, good numbers of trout. So if you want to, you know, kind of make that, transition from bait and weight and you've had your fill of pompano for the year you know now's a good time to break out the you know the seven six spinning rods and walk the beach throwing twitch baits and top waters and catch you some speckled trout and redfish for sure that was going to be my next question actually whenever you thought those beach trout were going to start showing themselves if you were waiting for some higher temperatures or what so it sounds like that's about to spark off that's pretty much one of my favorite things to do man i love that stuff yeah it, it, it's fun for sure it's one of those things so there's some people that are <clears throat> really masters at it. Some people just catch a few here and there. I'm one of those people that it doesn't seem, you know, whatever I do, I'll go out there and I might catch one or two, but I have, I usually have a lady fish or a blue fish showdown, but I'll go out there with Chris and he'll have 19 trout and I got 19 <laughs> blue fish. So we'll be throwing the same lure, but it happens like that. But yeah, those fish are definitely out there and there's been some big, big trout so far this year. Um, it's been, been a killer year for big trout too guys kind of catching them all over so like i said that fresh water all this rain we keep getting you know a lot of your fish on fort morgan area they're coming out of mobile bay a lot of your fish on west beach are coming out of west pass and then we don't see as many uh east of the orange beach pass i mean really i would i wouldn't i wouldn't say none but we see i've seen very few trout east of the orange beach pass and occasionally you will see some out on johnson's beach that come out of pensacola pass so uh if the food's there and especially if you have a lot of rain, uh, you'll notice that they get out there. And I, I, one thing I kind of pay attention to over the years, it seems like the summers and, and just years that we have lots of rain, you have way more trout on the beach and the beach trout fishing will just be 
you know, it's always good, but it'll be 10 times better. It seems those years that we just get swamped with rain because it just pushes so much fresh water out. You know, you'll notice like the dock light bite in the summer sometimes, instead of it just being killer all summer, you know, those years when you get a bunch of rain, it's, you know, it pushes a lot of that bait out, you know, in the path and in the Gulf. And, and so that's where those trout will go out there and hang out. So they, uh, those big female trout, you know, they're almost, I know we've had a conversation a few weeks ago, but they're almost like a whole mm. other species. You know, there's tanks. I mean, they're built completely different. They're so thick. They fight almost like a redfish. To me, they do it anyways. And, and they're eating, you know, they're eating big baits. You know, people think trout and they're throwing little small lures. But, I mean, they're eating some huge stuff. I mean, big L-wise, big mullet, whiting, you know, all that stuff. And so, you know, you can get away with throwing some bigger diving baits and, and still catch fish. Yeah, heck yeah, that's exciting, man. It's glad to glad to hear that that's heating up. Glad to hear the water temperature is getting a little up higher. What's <clears throat> what's the clarity like? Has that been messing up you guys' um, clarity on the beach? Any all this rain? It it will in spot, and this kind of goes back to what I've said before in the past. It's one of those things you just kind of got to cover ground and look around. You know, get in the truck and and kind of scout out the day before. Now that can change, you know, overnight as far as what's the next morning's going to look like. The main thing I'm worried about is just is completely brown chocolate milk water. Like even trout fishing, I don't care for that. And pompano fishing, I don't care for that. You know, you still have stuff schooling in that dirty water, but I, I just try to avoid it. Now, like if say Fort Morgan, for instance, you know, you're going to have a lot of dirty water just because you have so much rain throughout the southeast that's coming out of Mobile Bay. And those fish, you know, they're still going to have a salt mix there. So they're not really going to leave. I mean, they're going to hang out there. They may go to deeper water temporarily to get, you know, in some higher salinity water, but they may not necessarily leave. And as far as clarity goes, I mean, throughout Orange Beach Gulf Shores, it's been pretty decent everywhere that I've seen. I mean, the water was really clear a few weeks ago. I mean, it was actually crystal clear. Uh, and the main thing is just having these good tides as long as everything flushes out good. And we've had lots of wind, mm-hmm. so it's kind of keeping everything on the move. You know, we'll have hard south winds that will push stuff back on the beach. But, you know, we got north blowing right now. and It's going to blow north all night, northeast tomorrow over here. So without going tight all night, that'll push that dirty water out and then kind of keep it out. And so a few of those cycles, and it cleans up fairly good. Just kind of, it's just one of those things. It's Mother Nature, and it's going to do what it's going to do. You just kind of sometimes just have to ride around and look for that water color that you want. But Yep, we talk about that all the time on here is conditions. You can't. There's a lot of things you can change and manipulate, but conditions and weather is not one of them. You just got to let it roll and do the best with what you got. Yeah, you got to know in your mind what your standard is of, of what you want and and don't settle. You know, there's a lot of, uh, I know a few people that are, I would say, more successful pompano fishermen. And, and one thing that almost all of them have in common is not just sitting in one spot and not settling. They'll go look at, you know, they may drive down to, whatever mobile street and and the water's not exactly what they want it to look like and they're gonna be like oh you know what i'm gonna go somewhere else not where i want to fish but i'm gonna go find better looking water than this you might fish five or six holes you know in that same area you get there you set up you haven't caught anything pick up your rods move 100 yards down you might catch them you know i even experienced that with myself last weekend um i set up in this deeper i had two good looking holes right in front of me it just got done raining nobody was out on the beach i had it all to myself and i was kind of sitting there scratching my head i was like man which one of these holes do i want to go to i went to the one furthest to the west and caught a bunch of hardtails and it was just this deeper hole and it looked great and then i was like you know what we got plenty of time so i got two and a half hours of daylight so let's move over there picked up everything walked down the beach about 150 yards set up and before i got the second sand spike in i you know i'd already put one sand spike and casted that rod out before i got the second sand spike in we were hooked up with a pompano and we had our two-man nice. limit within 10 minutes just moving 150 yards to the next hole so you know not being stationary and just moving around and, and changing things as much as possible till you get the results you want is, is you know pretty much all you can do as a fisherman to help yourself out that's key yeah for sure man well that's a great report man you know we got to get a tip from you what you think for a surf fishing report tip this week yeah yeah so kind of back into the trout redfish stuff on the beach a lot of artificial lures that you can use and everybody has that mindset like oh man i gotta have you know, saltwater tackle. Um, and really the only thing that I would say might be a difference breaker or, or not a difference breaker, but a big difference would be maybe the hooks. Um, and, and usually when you get saltwater hooks, they're just going to be a heavier gauge. And that's just going to depend on the lure you're using. You know, with like twitch baits and stuff, I don't want a real thick wire hook. I actually don't mind a thin wire hook because you'll get a good hookup ratio. 
Uh, that thinner hook will penetrate the fish's mouth a lot better. And if you know if you have a decent pair of pliers and you're gentle, you're not going to bend them on the way out. Um, like a lot of the Rapala rip stops, neck traps, and stuff, you know they come with the thinner wire hooks, and I seem to hook up a lot more fish, especially trout with those thinner wire hooks, and I do with a big thick wire hook. Some of the bigger mirror lures and stuff like that have these big gaudy hooks on them, and they'll still catch a fish all day long. A lot of that stuff isn't always necessary just for your standard trout fishing. So, you know, if you have if you freshwater bass fish, striper fish, you more than likely have, if not one, but dozens of things in your tackle box that you can bring down without having to rebuy a whole arsenal as much as I'd love to sell you some. <laughs> you know, you can bring stuff like their spooks, all kinds of jerk baits. In the freshwater world, I mean, jerk baits are a huge thing, and there's so many different brands and sizes and styles. And, you know, I wouldn't recommend throwing like a, a Vision 110 mega bass out there at $25 a piece just because there's a chance of a, a bluefish or a Spanish or something getting a hold of it. But if you have some Rapala X wraps and, and Strike King jerk baits, anything like that works really good. Another huge thing that works great is a rattle trap, which is a lipless crankbait. So, like, if you have you know, Strike King red eye shads and, and stuff like that. You know, all that stuff works great in the surf for trout, redfish, flounder, and other species. You know, um, basically, if, you, if you're coming down, you know, anytime in the next, I'd say, four, five, six months, um, and you plan on walking the beach, you know, bring a lot of that stuff, especially if you have old plugs that, that aren't up to your standard on what you want for your for your bass fishing, you know, get some old, get some uh, replacement hooks on there. Get you some fresh hooks, and if it don't matter if they don't have any paint on it left, you can still throw that lure and catch trout and redfish and stuff like that on the beach. So, a lot of plugs in your tackle box will work. You know, even square bill crankbait, the Bandit 100 series, Bandit Footloose series. I use a little, uh, a lot of the Rapala DT Fat, three foot and and wake bait. Uh, Man's Baby One Minus is another you know freshwater lure that works good. Various spoons. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in plastics. You know, you see a lot of guys, this black drum has become a big thing uh, here recently, you know, on social media, people are going to the intercoastal and fishing for black drum. And, you know, like we try to fight fishing with a fly rod and stuff like that. You can pitch slob shrimp at them, but there's a lot of preacher baits that work really good at them. Like any type of crawfish, like zoom UV crawls, speed crawls, the strike king rage crawls, even regular jigs. You know, a lot of that stuff, especially like a green pumpkin or Okeechobee crawl that has some blue in it, looks like a blue crab. Um, so it's something you can definitely trick a big black drum or redfish tailing into eating. Uh, that's why I carry like Ned rigs at the store, a, a Z-Man Ned rig, the little crawfish and the TRD worms are awesome baits for bite fish and redfish and stuff. It's something that makes a quiet entry in the water. It's not super gaudy. It's more finesse, but it looks natural and it'll get bit for sure. Man, that's a, that's a great tip. I think that's going to have to be what I learned today. So I really like that a lot. It makes sense, man. I mean, um, <laughs> a lot, a lot of lures are just lures. A fish is going to eat it. I mean, if it looks like a Vin fish or something like that, I think you're going to have great success. I think that's a great tip, man. If, uh, if folks want to get up with you, Dusty and pick your brain or come see you, come see you down at Sam's bait and tackle, get a new setup. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, uh, obviously come see me at the shop or hit me up on my cell phone at 678-897-0167. Like I said, you're more welcome to come down here and pick our brains and we can hook you up with, you know, anything you need rod, rail, tackle-wise. And, and we sell a huge variety of hard baits for walking the beach and, and casting for trout and all that stuff. And we still have tons of pomp and our rigs and jigs. And, you know, we got we still got months of, of the surf fishing. We'll get you fixed up with anything you need. Awesome, buddy. We appreciate the report, and that's a great tip. We look forward to talking with you next time. Thanks, Captain Dusty. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, that's another awesome report, folks. That segment was brought to us by Day Cool Heating and Air. As the saying goes, if you don't like the weather in South Alabama, wait 10 minutes because it's going to change. But one of the things that is very predictable is the pricing at Day Cool Heating and Air. They offer flat rate pricing, and they don't charge for after-hours calls. Let's face it, your HVAC always seems to act up whenever you need it the most. Don't get stuck between a rock and a hot place. Day Cool offers flat $45 service calls, $59 tune-ups, and they offer free estimates on equipment replacement. The pros at Day Cool have been servicing Mobile and Baldwin counties for over a decade. Contact them at 251-633-5121 or check them out online at www.daycoolair.com or on the Day Cool Heating and Air mobile app. They are license number AL07028. All right, that's a great show. That's a lot of that's a lot of good information uh, this week. I learned a ton. Uh, you know, we got to do what did you learn before we get out of here today? And uh, like I said earlier, I, I definitely um, 
I do some bass fishing myself and I have a ton of bass stuff that now that I think about it could be versatile in freshwater and saltwater. I really, really liked what Captain Dusty was saying about that. And that could even go over, like he was saying, into the plastics, into some of those brush hogs, into some of those uh, those longer worms, the blue ones, watermelon seed and things like that. I guarantee a redfish eat a brush hog up. This week's What Did You Learn is brought to us by Bucks Island. They have new pontoon boats, bass boats, bow riders, and aluminum boats for sale. They provide boat service on all kinds of boats, even if they weren't purchased from Bucks. Visit them at 4500 Highway 77 in Southside, Alabama, or give them a call at 256-442-2588. All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up this week. That's another great Alabama saltwater fishing report. You guys, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like us to email you the podcast each week, just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767. Again, just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767. Subscribe to our email list, and we'll send to the new show each week. You guys keep whacking them. We'll talk to you all next time. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report was brought to you by B&M Pole Company. B&M Pole Company is more than just panfish. Check out their Sam Super Salt series designed for shallow water fishing for trout and redfish at bnmpoles.com. And also brought to you by Sam Stop and Shop. Sam Stop and Shop is your one-stop shop located at 27122 Canal Road in Orange Beach, Alabama. Sam's has a little bit of everything, including a deli, inshore, offshore, and surf fishing tackle. They also have bait, clothing, groceries, name brand sunglasses, and so much more. Stop by and shop or call them at 251-981-4245 today. And also brought to you by Photonist Defense, PD Pro Ultra Light Ultra Compact Night Vision Systems. Simply the best in class night vision systems ever built. Contact them at photonistdefense.com to learn more. Photonist Defense, Masters of Darkness. Also brought to you by Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks are proud to be your metal roofing headquarters for over 40 years. Save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the Gulf Coast. Buy it today, pick it up today. With the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks, your metal roofing headquarters. This week's Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Angelo Di Paola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty, your boating and beach property specialist. Check me out on Facebook at Angelo Di Paola Realtor, the coastal connection, or call me direct at 850-287-3440. And also brought to you by the Floribama Fishing Rodeo. The Floribama Fishing Rodeo is an annual fishing tournament held at Floribama Old River Grill. The Fishing Rodeo focuses on bringing families together for a fun weekend of fishing on the Gulf Coast. This will be held June 11th and 12th, 2021. And also brought to you by Hilton's Offshore Charts, bringing you the highest quality online satellite fishing chart since 2004. Your source for sea temps, altimetry, currents, and watercolor at hiltonsoffshore.com. And also brought to you by Fish Bites. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits as well as tackle at fishbites.com. Also brought to you by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Check them out at ccaalabama.org. And also brought to you by Foster Contracting, Fortified Roofing Pros. Enjoy less stress knowing you have reduced your risk for damage with Foster Contracting. Check them out at fortifiedroofingpros.com or call them at 251-447-2978.